Well, Larry Hughes is going to pop out and get the ball. Jordan's going to rub his man off of Leitner and then cut down the center and gets a nice pass from Larry Hughes. Okay, folks, welcome to this week's Believe in Wizards podcast. Uh, conveniently, this week, we are joined by the wizard himself, Walt Williams. Uh, Walt was a star at the University of Maryland from 82 to 92, or excuse me, 88 to 92. A uh, long time, bro. That's right. There's all the red shirts, gray shirts, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. Walt was first team All-ACC, second team All-American in 1992. Uh, he was the seventh pick in the 92 draft by the Sacramento Kings. Had a really productive NBA career for well over a decade. Played on some really fun teams to watch. The Houston Terps, maybe we'll get into the, that a little <laughs> bit today too. And now is a, is a huge part of the radio broadcast team for, for the University of Maryland. Uh, Walt, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Great to be here. It's our pleasure. I think um, before we let Larry jump in here a little bit, I would just like to personally say thank you to you because uh, as a Maryland alum and a huge Maryland basketball fan, you know, I don't think I'd had nearly the same program to root for in my time if you hadn't done what you've done. So uh, you're, you're truly a legend. So, so thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, man. Fun times. <laughs> Uh, so for anybody that, that doesn't know or isn't as familiar, um, obviously you went to the University of Maryland, uh, played under Bob Wade, who was uh, let go, and there were some violations that, that came after that. And so Gary Williams joined and, and uh, you know, you made the choice to stay when, when I think it would have been very easy for you to, to not do that. And there's a lot of talk going on right now about, you know, this one-time transfer rule and things like that and, you know, making it easier for guys to move on when potentially if things get tough. But uh, Walt, what, what made you stay? Why stick it out? Um, for me, man, it was just uh, it was just the uh, relationships I had established. Um, you know, this summer will be my 50th annual family reunion, you know, in North Carolina with my family. So that, that's what I know. That's what I was raised in and, and being uh, loyal and uh, uh, sticking, sticking with your family through thick and thin. And so I had established a relationship with, with my guys and uh, – I wanted to, to to stay with them. Um, for me, I didn't put pressure on myself of, of uh, going through the process of, of what should I do, stay or leave. I just let it come to me naturally. And every day when I woke up in the morning, it was, you know, I wanted to stay a Turk. And so uh, I went with that. Had no idea what it all entailed, but I just knew that I wanted to stick in there with my, with my guys and uh, uh, fight it through with them. Uh, that's great. And one of the things I, I admire most about you, obviously, but but my co-host here, too, is you guys both stayed home and, and tried to help the local school out and, and, you know, be loyal to the people that you were around. And, and that's something that I have a lot of respect for. You know, a lot of guys shy away from that, want to leave home and and uh, just just not want to be under that scrutiny and pressure of of people who've seen you play throughout your career. And, and uh, so they have a front row seat of, uh, of how you're progressing. So that, that type of scrutiny is uh, some, some don't want that, but for me, I don't know about you, Larry, but for me, man, I wanted all of that. You know, I wanted to uh, prove that I was a, a dominant player or that next level player. And I wanted to do that in front of my family and friends. Um, I wanted to follow in the footsteps of a, a legendary player like Lynn Bias. And so uh, uh, all of that went into uh, the decision I made of uh, staying home. Yeah, I, I just think when you, you had that foundation of being a, a hometown hero or really supporting, you know, your community, your environment, we always talked about there's no one going to take better care of you than like the people you know, at home. So that was really the thought process with, with, with us, you know, staying home. It's like, okay, we are good people. We're good kids. We've got good character. Um, there's no reason why home shouldn't take care of us, you know, and that was really the mindset, uh, you know, going in. And that was, you know, completely um, why I decided to stay home because I'm like, yo, I'm doing everything for the community. I'm talking, you know, good about it. I represent, you know, uh, you know, to the outside world of what we do here in St. Louis. So there's no reason why. Yeah, you know, hometown is going to take care of me. So that played a, a huge part in, in that decision to stay home for sure as well. 
And also, I'm a mama's boy, so I couldn't leave my mama. <laughs> Facts. Facts. No shame in that. <laughs> no shame in that. I, I had mama's boys tattooed across my chest, man. And I'm, 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 I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> Uh, so, so Walt, one of the things um, that that sort of led me to think about was, you know, one of the, the things you hear about this transfer rule is that other coaches will be constantly trying to poach players and things like that. When, when people kind of became aware of the Maryland situation, did, did you hear from like a lot of coaches right away about, you know, jumping ship and, and try to be like recruited away from Maryland? Um, I, I think that's a tough situation. I would imagine that there are probably very few coaches that would be in favor of that because of that element right there, you know, uh, uh, coaches recruiting your players uh, away from you. And I would uh, imagine a lot of relationships would be soiled in, in that situation there. But from a player's perspective, I, will, I believe that every player would, would, would love that environment to be able to say, I made a mistake coming out of high school. You know, you're young and impressionable. Who knows what's the right decision in, in that instance? So um, I can understand both sides of the table there and, and, uh, and so um, I, it, it, it's just tough. It's tough all the way around. Um, it, it's going to be interesting to see which, which way they lean towards because, like I said, I think both sides have a, um, a legitimate concerns or uh, what will, will make their will – what will, will give them an, an advantage in this situation. Hey, I mean, I, I've learned or, or kind of watched, like, you know, the, the transition or, you know, that portal into, into coaching is, is – a lot of times it's through the, the broadcast seat. Yeah. Uh, and obviously you got the pedigree, you got the knowledge, the information, everything that goes into to leading young people or kids down the, down, down the right road. You have many thoughts of coaching, you know, whether it be professionally, whether it be in the college ranks uh, anytime soon? Uh, you never know. Um, I'm a financial advisor right now, so I enjoy uh, being able to lend advice to, and we have some athletes uh, uh, as clients as well. So, you staying connected to the game and being able to advise and make an, an imprint or or make a difference uh, in that world is, is still there for me. I'm also a, a radio broadcaster at the Terp, a bas- the home games for the basketball team. So I'm able to be there and, and, and uh, lend firsthand advice to, to these young kids uh, and what I see out there that can help them. So I, I do stay connected to the game, even though – um, you know, I, I, I am an advisor. So, but you, you never know what happens. I mean, I can't rule anything out. I enjoy what I, what I do now. And so, um, but I never can say never. I love the game. So who knows what that will evolve into. How about you, Larry? Any thoughts on, on that end? I know you have your academy and you're, you're helping development and you're working on some cool things there, but, but any thought to like coaching specifically? Uh, not necessarily coaching. Um, just really in that d- development phase, whether it be uh, from a, from the youth standpoint or just um, I love film. I love watching film and I love breaking down a game. So an advisory role, um, you know, in, in the development process, whether that be professional or, you know, just getting started building those tools. But I man, it's a lot of different personalities. I love my <laughs> schedule. You know, it's just so many things I love about being, you know, retired and just having the ability to you know, to stick my hand in, in a, a number of different things. And, you know, I've learned that coaching, that coaching space, man, that's a, that's a 24, <laughs> 8, 3, 75, how, how many, you know, more days you want to put on it, man. But that's, that's, yeah. that's a strenuous deal. Uh, so just me being on the sidelines and pointing in the direction of, of getting kids, you know, uh, that development is, is where I'm at. For sure. Well, you got the, the wizard, right? The wizard. You know, yeah. We don't all get a nickname, you know, <laughs> you know, sometimes we never know where it comes from, but, but you got the wizard, man. I want to, I want to, you know, I want to understand, you know, where the wizard came from. And yeah. then the other deal was, was the hot socks. And, okay. and I, I, I spoke when we first started out about the influence that you had on me. The hot socks was definitely one of, one of those things, but Lawrence Moten is also a guy yeah. um, that I, that I watched. Um, you know, during my time of coming up as well. And he also wore the, wore the high socks. So first question, you know, where did the wizard, you know, come from? And then, you know, was the high socks, is that sort of a, you know, that a DC area thing or like yeah. what, you know, what brought that on? Well, first off, I got my name, the wizard from um, uh, in the off season, uh, my sophomore year, actually uh, going from a freshman into my sophomore year. 
um, just playing pickup games with the team. And and uh, one, my roommate, Jesse Martin, he used to just call me Wizzy Walt all the time out there on the court. And so uh, my co- coach Wade at the time was – uh, confused. He was like, what are you calling him? And so, uh, you know, uh, Coach Wade used to call me magic out there because of, you know, uh, the tricky passes I used to make out there playing pickup games and stuff like that. But he was like, yeah, somebody already already has that name, so I'm going to come up with a different one for you. And uh, he started calling me the Wizard, man. And, I mean, from that point, you know, it stuck. You know, my teammates started calling me that, and it, it just stuck with me throughout. So, it, it came from uh, it came from Bob Wade uh, initially. Uh, with the high socks, man, it's funny. Um, I used to watch uh, George Gervin highlights, the Ice Man, and so um, um, this one particular inner squad scrimmage we had, uh, I was just messing around and pulled my socks up, and man, I had a dominant inner squad scrimmage. You know, my freshman year coming in, and so. Uh, I, I just kept them up there, and 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 the funny thing was, I I didn't I didn't wear my high socks just to play basketball. I wore them, period. So, if I would go, you know, from this DC area, we have uh, musical shows called Go Go's, and so uh, whenever I I would go to the Go Go with shorts on, and I would have high socks, or <laughs> you know, so it was my it was the way I naturally walked around in the streets, you know. So it wasn't just a fad or a hoop thing for me. It was a uh, something that I felt very comfortable comfortable with, and it was a comfort level for me. And then all of a sudden, it, it started to take on its its own thing, and you start to see all of the all of the guys around in, in, around the area with the high socks. And so then when I would watch college games, you would see high socks out there, and you automatically knew, oh, that guy must be from the DMV area. And then it just started taking off. It started just being uh, something that was nationwide. And so uh, it just kind of took off from there. And, and I, I can remember playing against guys from the area, man, and guys have on four, five, six pairs of socks on. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the nice thick socks. I think they all used to get them from the same area and from the same place. Yeah. So I, 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 definitely, I definitely remember, uh, you know, how that, how that trend started to, to keep going. And, and it was in an era where, you know, guys' with socks were so low that you could see the tape that was on their ankles. Uh, so I was, I was, uh, I was certainly set myself apart from the normal way of how guys, the swag that they had out on the court. Yeah. So, um, you know, playing in, in different arenas, I used to get a lot of ridicule from the fans about my socks, man. But for me, I, it never bothered me at all. It, it was a comfort level to me. And, uh, and uh, I just felt like, hey, it was just something that was different. And so I, I went with it. It wasn't something that uh, uh, that I shied away from at all. That's what's up. Yeah. Uh, so you, you talked a lot about, um, you know, just representing the area and, and you know, keeping with the, the rich tradition, you know, tradition here in, in the you know, general DMV area. So one of the upcoming things that I think a, a good portion of our listeners will be familiar with is this um, Basketball County um, documentary that, that Kevin Durant's been producing and, and his his company. And I think Victor Oladipo is involved and Quinn Cook and, and some of the other local names that you know, some of the DeMatha guys yeah. Um, yeah, I understand that you appear in that documentary. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and how you got involved? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, just being from the PG County area, I mean, they, they publicize it a lot now, but uh, it's rich in tradition in the number of players and the legendary players that, that come from, from that area. And, uh, I mean, you're talking about when you look at per state, you look at a state in who produces NBA players, I mean – we're not even talking about the state of Maryland. We're talking about this little county within the state that that's just produces uh, a mass amount of uh, of uh, uh, major D1 players and, and NBA players. And so it, um, I'm one of the guys who were, who was early on in the, in the process. You know, during my time frame, they didn't publicize in the NBA where guys were from as much. You didn't know it like you do today. And so for me coming up, I had no idea that I could be an NBA player. Um, you know, um, I didn't, I didn't, I just didn't imagine someone coming from where I was from uh, being on TV playing basketball. So I, I, when I watched the NBA game, I, I always looked at it as uh, these guys come from somewhere else uh, that's, that's, that's playing at this level. So my focus was lasered in on, uh, especially when I was in college, 
uh, I went into games thinking that today, the, pe the people who are in the arena today, they're going to see that I'm the best player on this floor today. It wasn't a, a, a something that I was – a goal that I was trying to attain in the future of, okay, if I do these things here, I'm going to be an NBA player. Uh, like I said, I, I didn't even know that that was a possibility until I saw someone like Len Bias and, and when he got drafted. But up until that point, I mean, even seeing him get drafted, it still looked like – seemed to me like that, that guy right there was extraordinary. Um, it's not something that can happen – to someone like myself. So I wasn't focused in on that. And, uh, but, uh, you know, just playing against the, the great players from this area, you talking about guys who, who didn't make it to the NBA, but that were major D one players and they were public school, you know, the environment. Now you got a lot of, a lot of these guys come from a private school um, environment, but in my day it was, it was public school and, and just in my public school league, you know, playing against guys like, Mike Tate, Henry Hall, Byron Tucker, um, you know, John Turner. Uh, these guys were major, major guys. Uh, Monty Williams, um, j just just uh, fantastic players from this area. And we all played in the same public school league and went on to be major D1 players. And it, it seemed like every team had at least one major D1 guy, uh, possibly two and three. Uh, that went on to to a major level at, at the college at, at the college ranks. So I had some tremendous competition uh, uh, just in the Prince George's County area. Not let alone the you know guys that were from the Washington D.C. area and, and Virginia area as well. I remember the, this has been probably ten years at this point, but ESPN the magazine had an article sometime in the two thousands about how there were more all stars that had come out of PG County than any other state in the country. Um, I mean, obviously, that's probably an outdated stat, and I don't know if that's still true, and I'm sure the documentary gets into is, that, man. but it's it a lot of names. <laughs> and it's amazing. It's amazing when you say you compare this little, this county to other states, you know, uh, if we added Baltimore, you know, I mean, it'd go to another level as well, you know, so it, it, when you're talking about the actual state of Maryland, so uh uh, just keep in mind, we're talking about a, a, a county within the state that is producing this this caliber of uh, of play. So, w when did you see that that change start to happen? So, you were you were coming up playing, and you didn't necessarily have the you know the, the dream big you know attitude as far as the, you know you know making it you know to play in the NBA or being paid to play. So, how how do these how do these kids you know or, or when did that transition happen? If, if you saw it. Uh, to start to dream big, to think that, you know, they could be, you know, one of the greats or they could, you know, yeah. you know make it out of the hood and make it to the NBA. You know, when did that change? Um, I know for myself, I was, a, I was a, a, a player that was a little bit ahead of the curve, being a six foot eight guy who handles the ball. And at University of Maryland, I was actually a point guard out there. Um, in those days, Magic Johnson was like an anomaly, you know, like he was a, an exception to the rule. You didn't look at guys my size and say, OK, these guys can handle the ball and, and, and make plays out here like like the smaller point guards. And so um, I believe that uh, and, and that was that came from I didn't play on a team in, in an in a organized situation until I was in high school up until then. I was just pure street ball player. And so, you know, you're playing out on the streets. There's no position. If you can't handle the ball, you're probably not going to get the ball that much, you know. Yeah. And so um, I just incorporated what, ha what I had been doing my whole life into, uh, into an organized situation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and um, I really think I did have an impact on the, the influx of players starting to come from this area. You start to see the 6'5 and up guys being ball handlers and, and wing guys. And so you see a lot of those guys start to come from this area. And, and that's what a pro is. You know, when, you, when you're at the high school rank, guys are at a certain speed and a certain size. Then you go to the college level, uh, that same guy becomes a bigger, stronger person, but have the same quickness. And then you go to the NBA level, 
that 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 same player becomes an even bigger player, you know. And so now you're talking about six five and six six guards when you get to that level. So I I think that the learning at an early age that because you're six six and six seven, you don't have to have your back to the basket. You, you're able to do a lot of different things out on the court. I think that started to be you started to see an influx of players in this area start to play that way, and uh, all of a sudden you start to see just a whole host of guys. Uh, 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 going to the next level. Yeah, and, and the reason why I say that is because sometimes we, you know, we forget or, or, or think that it's not about the guys that that came before us. Yeah. But for for me, really, that allows you know the young people to dream is to see those people go that were right, you know, right in front of them to see them go. So yeah. I think for, you know for 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 that thought process, man, is that you know you you know when when you're in an area with that much talent, you had some influence in the way that they dream to become a basketball player, yeah. for, for sure. You're absolutely right. And so I think that uh, just just uh, we, we've done a, a fantastic job of being able to come back and, and speak to the kids at camps and in and, and, and different um, environments like that to be able to show, a, yeah, you see me on TV playing this game, but I'm right here in, in real life for you. I come from the same place you come from. Um, we, we are in the same area. So this dream is not just a dream. This can be a reality for real. You know, you can see me, you can touch me, and I'm right here. I'm from the same place you're from. So it is real. Um, I don't know if that was the, the case back in the day. Um, we, we just didn't interact with with uh, the guys at the NBA level as much as, 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 it's, as it's done now. And so I, I think that has... Uh, been a huge, a huge uh, uh, thing in terms of of uh, these younger players believing that it's a reality and working towards that. Being the social media age and stuff like that, guys, guys have more access to to film from from previous generations and have just you know more awareness of kind of who is from their area. And mm-hmm. you know, Larry being kind of one of the the leaders of that group from the St. Louis area, you know, you hear a lot more about you know here's the St. Louis community, and then. You know, locally, uh, so I'm I'm the same age as Kevin Durant. So I remember being in the locker room after a, like high school game and seeing the coach would put up stats from around the area who did really well, and I'm like, oh, this Kevin Durant fellow, he seems to be having a lot of good player of the weeks in a row. Like, obviously, he turned out pretty good. You know, but now I think everybody does like a really good job. It seems like of kind of paying respect to to who influenced them, and you maybe you didn't hear that as much 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, I don't I don't think he did. And, uh, you know, um, I I think just for me personally, just PG County dudes uh, just playing against, uh, you know, kids from Washington, D.C. and Virginia, you know, it's a difference, especially uh, playing on the playground. Um, I always joke around, but it was serious. I didn't I didn't. approach the game until college when I when I played basketball it was always this hint of of violence like a fight can break out at any moment and uh and so that was just a part of basketball and so those those type of feelings create a toughness within you um understanding that no matter what happens out here um uh, you have confidence in yourself to, that you're going to be all right and successful in any environment. And uh, it wasn't until college that I realized, oh, my goodness, we're out here. We're just playing basketball, and that's it. Nothing else is going to happen here. We're just playing basketball. So it wasn't until I was in college until I actually had that feeling inside. But I think it helped me a lot because uh, it was just a lot of a lot of things outside of just the game uh, uh, that, that uh, grew inside of me and helped me get to the next level. As you know, Larry, it's not just about your skill set out here, especially in our day when the game was a lot more physical on a perimeter. You know, it wasn't just, oh, you're quick and you're athletic. When people put them hands on you, they could nullify that, that part of the game. So it always reverted back to what is your skill set like? Right. And um, I, I think that that was uh, – that's why we were – uh, so good offensively in our day, regardless of uh, the physicality that, that went along with uh, the perimeter game. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So I, I know you, you know, well, I'm watching, you know, the, the, the last dance, you know, like, uh, yeah. you know, like, 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 like it's church, man. I'm not even going to lie. Like, like I'm, I'm gearing up, you know, for the last dance, like it's like it's church Sunday. Yeah. But, you know, just the thoughts of, 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 you know, your thoughts on watching the, the last dance, you know, where, 
where does that bring you back to? Uh, what sort of mindset uh, does that give you just to have the ability to, to just walk down, you know, memory lane a little bit uh, during, during this documentary? Oh man, it's great. I think it's great for not only, you know, dudes in our era to just reminisce, but also for the younger, the younger uh, players so they can just see, I'm sure they hear the stories or you can see the highlights, but um, you know, just to be able to, I think this last dance is kind of reliving the environment we played in and, and you can see uh, the, the circumstances that, that uh, 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 the greatness of Jordan uh, came out of. And I think you get a, a more of an appreciation to who he was and, and what he brought to the game. And uh, man, it's, 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 it's just fun times to be able to, hit, to see that. And uh, the thing that came to my mind uh, initially when I saw the first one was I hope they touch upon the introduction of Michael Jordan. When they used to introduce his name in that, in, that, in that Chicago arena, how loud the arena was, it was like, it was deafening. It was something that I had never heard before. I'm talking about even when guys hitting a big shot to, to win a game or something like that and how the crowd goes off. I've never heard anything like when they just introduced this dude's name. <laughs> you know, it was crazy. You would look around in the stands and you would, you would see kids uh, terrified from the, the the sound of the noise in there uh, at times, and so I mean, just just you know, seeing that little restaurant in the in the uh, back in the tunnel right before you're about to come out on the court, and how they used to have the signs and heckling us and, and things of that nature. It's just a, it was just uh, man, it was just fun times to, to play under that scrutiny and and just in that environment and uh, just playing against a guy like Jordan, you know. Um, um, just the, the quickness and the strength that he played played with. And, and not only that, but just how smart he was in the game and how he could hear plays and he would direct or talk to his teammates and tell, tell them exactly what was about to happen. And so those things like that, um, he just really ate, elevated um, his teammates and, and took the whole team to another level with his knowledge of the game and his intensity that he brought uh, uh, to the floor. While you're waiting this out at home with us, you can still have some fun betting at betonline.ag. No NBA, NHL, or MLB. You might think there's nothing to bet on, but you'd be wrong. BetOnline still has hundreds of places to wager, including their online casino with poker and blackjack. And sports aren't totally done either. As you've probably seen on ESPN recently, the NBA 2K League and other esports leagues are available to bet on. You can even bet on things like American Idol or who might win this season of Big Brother or even the upcoming elections. There's also their $750,000 poker series. So there's still plenty of fun to be had. So make sure to go to betonline.ag and use the promo code MYPOD100, all caps, MYPOD, M-Y-P-O-D 100, to receive your welcome bonus on your first deposit. Again, that's betonline.ag and use the promo code MYPOD100, M-Y-P-O-D 100. Bet online, your online wagering experts. And and did you did you have any um, any ill will, any any sort of you know animosity, any sort of you know issues with with him uh, during during your days playing? Oh, absolutely. You all, you know, you come into that thing, you think you're the best. So you know, guy dominating the game like that. Every chance, every time we played against him, I always had a chip on my shoulder because I wanted to prove that you know, hey, I was just as good or whatever against against him. So you certainly came into every game with with this intensity saying that, you know, hey, I'm gonna show I'm gonna show the world today that, that this guy's not the separator. So you always had that that intense and that that competition level when when going up against a, a guy like him. You know, a lot of times, hey, you were wrong that day, but, you know, you had that mindset going into it. Like, uh, you know, you were going to prove something to him and in the world today about uh, your, your skill set as compared to his. Yeah, that, that's, that's why it's good for, for me to talk to the OGs, as I like to call y'all, man. Y'all, y'all came before me, but you're also, you know, peers of MJ. So I, I look at him as, as my OG. So in, in a sense, I'm going to. You know, I'm I'm gonna bow down to you know to 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 some degree because you know that's the OG. But it's good to hear, you know, the peers. You know, his peers are guys that you know went up against him. You know, every night. You know, in yeah. his prime. You know, they have that, like what I have for Kobe. Like I wanted yeah. to get at Kobe every time we play. So it's good to it's refreshing to know that you know everyone. There's a level for, for you know for everyone when you talk about you know, competition and, and, you know, the greatest players to ever do it. So 
Shout out. Yeah, you know, you know, uh, uh, some guys come from, uh, playing this game, and they, they, they even when they're gone, they they receive so much publicity about uh, uh, what they've done in their career, what have you. But you know, for yourself, uh, in every position, you know, from the one to the five, the best one to the worst one, the degree of separation is just so small, man. I mean, the guys are at this level, are just, they are just so talented. And so I, I, I talk to my sons often about the, the the most difficult guys I had to guard. And a lot of times my sons never heard of these guys, you know, And but it was just so much talent uh, when you get to that level. And uh, man, I mean, when, you, when you're talking about a guy like Michael Jordan, um, he was just a, a, a guy that was just at another level, but it, it was just so many talented guys and, and, and so many guys that uh, had that sense of urgency and, and that desire to, to dominate the game. And so it was just great. It was just great to play against those guys, play uh, in, in that physical environment and just, just compete, man. And so it, it, was just, it was just great times. Can you please tell this story about when you were a rookie and trying to cross over Jordan? I've heard this recently, but I'd love to hear it from you directly. So, so I, I was uh, uh, in my in my rookie year. We uh, just going back and forth with contract negotiations. It didn't end until the last preseason game, the day before, actually, and so or, or that morning, actually. And so um, our last preseason game was against the Bulls. I was playing with the Kings. And so I believe it was in Sioux Falls. So it wasn't in a, a city that uh, had an NBA team. So um, the games was, were not public, publicized. So I flew in that morning, didn't know any plays. So basically when I came in the game, it was kind of like a pickup game or, or did we go into a pick and roll action and then play off of that. And so because I was a ball handler, um, you know, Scotty Pippen's guarding me and Michael Jordan's guarding uh, Mitch Richmond, my two guard at that time. And so we were running a three, two pick and roll with me handling the ball. And then they were, uh, the coach was anticipating, Coach St. Jean was anticipating sw- a switch happening between Pippen and Jordan. And uh, so Pippen wasn't a, an, an elite defender at that time. It was, Jordan was a bit ahead of him. So um, uh, they, we wanted to get an isolation with Mitch Richmond against Pippen. So I go off the pick and roll and they switch. And instead of me running the play and throwing the ball to Mitch for isolation, I, I had a quick thought in my head that said, oh my goodness, I can call my boys up after this game and let them know I got this bucket on Jordan. So I waved Mitch off <laughs> and went into my ISO mode. And so uh, my, my signature move at, at that time was uh, a crossover, which Allen Iverson made it a lot more uh, uh, notable to the, to the masses. But I had that in my game be, before Allen Iverson did. And so uh, that was my go-to move going to the basket. And so uh, I uh, was setting Jordan up for it. And when I gave him the, the crossover, he, he stuck his hand in between and stole it. It went down on the other end and, and did his emblem dunk. And then when he turned around, he came back down and tapped me on the butt and said, hey, man, we watch film up here. I knew he was going to do that fake-ass crossover. <laughs> so that was my first introduction to the, to the next level. And I understood that, oh, my goodness, they are watching footage and they know everything that, that you're going to do up here. And, and that's, that's the unique thing about the NBA. It is, the, the set, like I mentioned earlier, the separation from the best to the worst is just so small. So – when you're watching film and reading scouting reports, those things become the separator where you can learn every nuance and what, what a player is doing so you can stop that. And so I always, I always said that it's, it's, it's not easy making it to the NBA, but it's tougher to stay there because every year the question is always asked by the NBA and they take a whole year. They look at your, your game and they write it down on, on a piece of paper of all the things that you got. And then the question at the end of the season or starting the new season is always, Okay, what else do you have? Because we're going to take that away from you. And if you can't answer that question, if you don't have anything else to bring to the table, then the, the meter starts. You can turn it over and start the meter counting because you don't have much time left in that league. You know, you always had to come back and refine things. You always had to come back and get better or the scouting report was going to take you away from the game. So um, um, uh, those type of nuances in the game, uh, I understood that early on. And uh, that, that helped me uh, stay in, in the league as long as I did. Hey, well, how many times are you asked if, um, if you can play in today's game? 
Oh man, I get asked that all the time, man, all the time. And you know, it's always the same. Of course, I would say, man, I would be at a whole nother level in this environment. No, no touching on the perimeter. I could just go to the basket and dudes not hand checking me crazy. I mean, you know, I wasn't the quickest guy, but but because I could shoot it right in your face, I made guys have to guard me so close. And so uh how close a guy had to guard me i could just go to the basket and get to the free throw line a lot easier than than in our day you know uh and then off the ball you know passing it and then running through that lane guys are not hitting you hitting you and and lighting you up running through the paint uh, like they did it just the physicality is not the same so i would i think that i would be uh man it would it would be another level if i played in this environment yeah, I, I think the uh, you know the, the youngins that are that are watching now. I mean, you know, the sophomores, juniors, seniors in high school, the guys that are you know projecting themselves in the NBA, are starting to take more appreciation of how the game was played. You know, how physical the game was played, how much just how much effort it took to actually get from point A to point B, and they're starting to you know because I'm starting to have conversations with younger guys like, oh, it was real back then. Oh yeah, and I'm like, <laughs> yes, yes, it was. So. You have something the game has 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 elevated. There's been an evolution of the game, mm-hmm. but again, any time that you can get to to shout out the guys that came before you, you got to do it because you know it wouldn't be this way if if it wasn't like guys for yourself. Just making sure that we want to see an offensive game. Yeah, and you know in the '80s and '90s they played a lot of defense, low scoring games, but when the public starts to see these guys with these crazy skills of shooting the basketball, dribbling the basketball, Mm -hmm. uh, fluid motions, being tall, you know, they want to see the ball go in a hole. So that's a product of of what we did before. And now obviously, you know, what the game is today is, it's it's a great game. And I, you know, I I think a lot of us guys could have played, you know, you know, in this area as well. Hey, I I agree a hundred percent. I mean, um, uh, when you, I, I believe that I, I was talented enough after my freshman year to play at the next level, but certainly the physicality of the game, I was like 175 pounds and stuff. So just the physicality of the game that went along with it. I mean, uh, just the, the skill set and quickness and athleticism, those things paled in comparison to the physicality of it all. And so that's why you saw guys, when somebody left as a junior, it was just like, oh, my goodness, he left early. He left in his junior year yeah. because, I mean, it was grown men out there, and they certainly uh, uh, put them put them hands on you to let you know that this was a different, a different game than, than the high school and college level. And so that, that physicality was just paramount at the NBA level. So it, it, it was uh, much more than, than just which, what you can do basketball-wise. So you had to be able to be able to sustain uh, uh, taking those forearm shivers, man, and, and coming back the next day and being just as good. So it was, a, it was a different environment, different element of the game that was to the forefront. NBA job, the best job you've had? Oh, absolutely, man. I mean, my, my goodness. It was just, you know, living it, you, you take it for granted, man. When it was over, you just look back and go, oh, my goodness, what was that that just happened? You know, uh, I was just living in a fairy tale land, you know, just, just, just normal, just normal, a normal way of life. You know, uh, the amount of travel, the, the places that we were able to see um, um, and just just doing what you love. Uh, you know, it, it was definitely tough. Uh, uh, the, like I said, the physicality of it, the what you take your body through in order to uh, be able to go get after it year after year. But all the other things surrounding uh, uh, the game, it was it was definitely worth it. Uh, the sacrifice that you put into it. And uh, man, I, I wish I can go through it again to to be able to the things that I took for granted to be able to do that part of it over again. Um, you know, uh, uh, man, it was just a, it was a whirlwind, and it was it was a great time. And like I said earlier, it was it was a fairy tale when I when I played the game and, and I was on the court and I would look up in the stands, it looked it looked normal. But after the game was over and I and the first game I went to watching it from the stands, looking down on the court. It was just unbelievable how it came into this funnel and just all of these people looking down in this little court. It, it was just a certain, it was a different perspective. I, it did not seem that way at all when you're on the basketball court and you're looking up in the stands. I mean, it, it was just normalcy to me from that perspective. So 
um, it, it, it certainly gave a, a view or a perspective on the game that I did not have while I was playing. Uh, well, you, you mentioned a, a name that a lot of locals will be familiar with earlier on, uh, obviously Len Bias, uh, you and, and fellow former Terp and, and now uh, broadcast announcer for the Capital City Go-Go, Tony Massenberg recently wrote a book called Lessons from Lenny, sort of about his influence on you guys particularly, but also to the area. Yeah. For anybody that's you may be listening outside the area that's not as familiar or younger and, and, and doesn't really know their, their history as much, like, can you talk a little bit about about Len and what he was like, obviously the Coach K comment about the two best college players, you know, he yeah. saw were, were Jordan and, and Len Bias. Um, I don't think people realize how, how big time he was projected to be. I mean, he was absolutely amazing. Um, I actually grew up as a Georgetown Hoya fan, you know, John Thompson, um, Bebe Doran, uh, Patrick Ewing, uh, those guys, Reggie Williams. Um, and then uh, my father is from North Carolina, and so he took me to a North Carolina Turk game one time. And, uh, man, I got an opportunity to see Bias for the first time live. And the thing that stood out to me was just how pretty his jump shot looked. I mean, it was, it was different than everybody's on the court and that I had ever seen until that point. It was just beautiful, and it, it mesmerized me. And so from that point, I started to uh, – uh, uh, watch highlights you know if you remember the I don't know how uh, if this outdates you but it was a sports show called the sports machine with George Michael and uh, man I used to tune in that all the time to be able to see the Turk highlights so I can see Len Bias and so uh, he, he captured me or my attention um, um, immediately and then all of a sudden I started watching more Turk games than the Hoya uh, games and so I, I became a Turk fan and so you know, playing with Tony Massey, but we, we didn't talk about Lynn Bias a, a, um, uh, a lot while we were playing. But afterwards, when we would get together as, as teammates and reminisce about back in the day, we saw that we had a kinship in our feelings about uh, Lynn Bias and how he impacted us. And so we thought it would be a good idea to, to write a book uh, about him. Many know about um, the circumstances surrounding his death and in that part of the equation, but um, very few know about um, the, the impact that he had on, on us as individuals and in the community as a whole and, and the university. And so we wanted to really shine a light on uh, the aftermath of, of, of Lynn Bias and the effect that he had after, after his death. And uh, so, you know, many, many know about him being a two-time ACC Player of the Year, Athlete of the Year, number two pick to the, to the Celtics. But, but off the court, you know, he, he, uh, we, we touch upon laws that were put in place because of his death and, and, and the mass incarceration and, and how uh, uh, those laws uh, disproportionately affected our communities. And uh, we touch upon the, the academic changes that came about uh, uh, because the cover was pulled back on the university and, and, and what, was, what was going on with the student athletes. So um, because of that, you, you, you start to see things put in place and uh, to, to assist the, the student athlete and to graduate at a, at a higher rate. So, so in, in, Lynn, in Lynn's death, it was sort of a rebirth of the, of the University of Maryland, and uh, we wanted to uh, touch upon or talk about what that all entailed. I got to go as like a student reporter my senior year. They did an on-campus um, premiere of the 30 for 30 about Len without bias. And they like somehow threw us like literally in the front row, which I don't know how we ended up with, <laughs> with prime seats. Maybe we were so close, nobody wanted to be up that front. But um, it, it was pretty quiet in there the entire time. And then when they got to the point of the documentary, they talk about Len's younger brother, who was also um, died tragically a few years later. Uh, you just heard hysterical sobbing, and it turned out his whole family was basically in the row right behind me. And like it was just, she had told that story so many times about Len to be able to to use it for positive impact that I think she was able to kind of keep it together through that because they just tried to you know focus on like how that could be a positive influence on people. Yeah, I was I was actually um, I got filmed for that document as well, even though I didn't play with Lynn, but I came right after. I was the next thing, if you will, uh, that that came after him. So they interviewed me, but you know, it, it to, to give you the degree of how uh, impactful uh, he was to me, 
uh, in the middle of doing that, um, I, you know, I broke down and, and I, you know, it, it wasn't until like I was in my mid forties that I was, I, that I was able to talk about uh, limb bias without uh, uh, crying about it. You know, it was just, it was just devastating to me. You know, I actually played against his brother. We were in the same, he was one of the, the players that played in our public school league as well, you know, fantastic player. You know, he was a great player and on his way uh, uh, before he was tragically uh, uh, killed. And so, uh, man, it was just, it was just like, it was devastating on the area um, as a whole. I mean, he was like our family member, our son, our, our cousin, our best friend. He was everything to us. And so it, it, it impacted the community in this, this, uh, this area. Uh, it impacted it tremendously. Again, the book is called uh, Lessons from Lenny. Um, if you're a Terp fan, you're a Walt fan, you're a Len fan, definitely check that out. Um, you know, I think it's like we talked about earlier, it's another way of kind of, you know, helping inform a younger generation about local impactful players. And that's a cool thing about what's going on now with The Last Dance and this PG County documentary and, and books like yours. Uh, it's definitely, it's a lot easier to get information about stuff. I don't think people would have gotten, you know, 15, 10 years ago. Yeah, let me give a little shameless plug real quick. Please. You can get it anywhere books are sold. And but also if you want an autograph version of it from me and Tony, you just go to lessonsfromlenny.com and you have autograph versions uh, available there. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I always I always like to say, man, when experiences are written down, they turn into history. So, yeah. uh, you know, really, really push that message of you never know, you know what sort of information will come and what sort of progress will come after that experience. But if we write it down, you know, it, it becomes history. And I definitely follow the, the, the land by story and, and pull some inspiration from it uh, just with family story and, and growing up in the inner city and, and different things that are around you that you can get involved with more so than anything that the strength of, of the family and the strength of prayer, just really knowing when it's time and knowing, um, you know, all the, 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 you know, the things that go along with, with a young person growing up and, and making money and trying to keep, you know, trying to keep us, us young, young black men safe. You know, that, that really uh, resonated for me is like, in order to make your mom proud and make your family proud, you got to make it to the finish line. In order to make it to the finish line, you got to try to stay above that line. You know, so that gave me inspiration to always try to maintain and stay above that line. So that, that, you know, that on reach, you know, a, a long way for sure. Yeah, you know, I've had the opportunity to uh, uh, be around the, the Bias family and uh, man, so much tragedy that family has been through and how they have persevered. I mean, it's it's just extraordinary how strong that, that family is. And, uh, you know, just like you mentioned right there, uh, I remember uh, Mrs. Bias talking about in her son's death, she didn't recognize how many people loved him and how proud that made her. And, uh, you know, that meant something to me. I, I remember going out on the playground. I don't know if you guys did it, but I'm sure, you know, you go out there and you play pickup games, but right before the game starts, everybody yells out a name who they're going to pretend to be that day. And always, I always wanted to be Lynn Bias. And, uh, and that meant something to me. That was, had a profound um, impact, uh, um, impact on me because I wanted the kids in the neighborhood. I wanted that. I wanted them to go out on the basketball court and pretend like they were me. And so I felt like the place that I could do that was at the University of Maryland because that's the, that's the kind of impact Lynn Bias had on me. So he was very inspirational, um, not only just on the basketball court, but I, I, want, I want my mom to, to feel that way as, as well. I want my mom to go, man, I didn't know that my son had this, this many people who um, want to follow in his footsteps or love him and things like that. So it, it inspires me to be the best person that I can be. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. And, and, and so thank you for talking about that. I'm sure that's not like the, the easiest topic all the time, but uh, definitely, definitely important. And I think folks locally that are listening to this will, will get a kick out of that too. Um, just, just speaking of some other Terps for a minute here, uh, at some point in your career, you were traded from Portland to Houston, actually for Scotty Pippen. Um, but you ended up playing with a, a couple other Terps, uh, Steve Francis, I want to say Terrence Morris and one more, right? Oh, that's right. Tony. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, talk about, you know, kind of reuniting with, with some other local guys. Man, it was, it was great. I mean, especially, 
um, you know, coming from that Portland Trailblazer team, that was a that was a tough blow to me for me personally because we had just lost to the Spurs in the Western Conference Finals. I, I just felt like we had a team that had mid-range players that was like in between that five to nine year period. So I felt like we had the experience and we had some longevity left in us to be able to get this thing right. And so to to get traded, uh, it was it was uh, disheartening to me, but. Um, coming to the Rockets uh, organization, um, you know, uh, being around Steve Francis, uh, he was a guy that let me stay in his home for the first uh, few months until I until I uh, uh, got my home. You know, normally you stay in a hotel or what have you, but uh, you know, we, we're Turks, and so he allowed me to stay in his home, man. And so uh, that was a great uh, uh, situation there, just getting to know him and and. Uh, uh, you know, playing with Terrence Morris and Tony Massenburg, I believe that was the year that we won the championship, uh, the Turks won the championship. So we had a lot of bragging rights in that Houston locker room, <laughs> a lot of bragging rights. Uh, uh, so it was awesome to be able to talk that trash to the guys and uh, knowing that we were, the, we were the champs. So it was, it, was, it was great. It was a great scenario to go through. Uh, Walt, just maybe one more thing but before we get you out of here. Um, obviously, you, you spent a lot of time around uh... – you know, this year's Maryland team, and we didn't get to see how that played out. How good do you think that team was, or how far do you think they could have gone? Um, I think that team is very talented. I think they was just coming into their own, um, you know, uh, I think they were just starting to realize that they had a good team, but also within having a good team, you have guys that you can count on down the stretch. I think it's important uh, for the the dominant player or players on the team to – not only establish that in the game so that your opposition knows, you know, what to, what they, what they're going to get um, in that game. But I think it's also important that in practices and things like that, that you establish that with your own teammates and your own coaching staff, that they understand that I'm a guy that you can count on when you get thick out there. And I think that towards the end part of the season, you start to see a guy like, uh, Jalen Smith sticks start to establish himself as someone who who you can count on uh, uh, to score in clutch moments around that basket and and even uh, uh, shooting it from the three point line. I think that uh, also uh, um, Cowan he showed that as well. You know, being a point guard, a guy who has the ball in his hands all the time, and just his decision making uh, down uh, throughout the game. I think early on going into games, he. Uh, was just uh, zoned in on scoring, and that was his impact. But I think as the season went along, he started to understand that uh, uh, getting into that paint and drawing attention and and kicking it to guys open, he started to understand that he's elevating the other guys and making the game easier for other guys. And then later on in the game, because of the way he established uh, the environment throughout, he could start to dominate later on in games if necessary. And so I think those nuances in the games in the game was starting to be established by by those two guys. And and I, I think that that's important. It, it's great that you have a lot of guys that you can count on that can get it done throughout the game. But in those moments, those last few moments where, you know, it's, well, can I just give this guy the ball and he get it done for me? Uh, those questions have to be answered. And and I think that uh, Sticks and, and Cowan did that. And, and I think that that would have went a long way when you start to talk about tournament, tournament time. Larry, you got anything else you want to talk to Walt about before we call today? I'm, I'm good, man. I appreciate the time. I appreciate hey, the time. I just want to say once again, man, like, um, you know, Larry, you, you, you're you not a guy who is, like, highly publicized in the game or what have you, but you were certainly one of the dominant players, man. You were one of the focal points when we went into games. You were one of the guys that we, we circled and said, hey, we got to stop this guy. So, I mean, you are a great player, man, and it's a pleasure to sit down and talk with you, man, about the game and, and uh, just reminiscing about back in, back in our day. And, and uh, man, it's just an honor to be able to talk with you, man, because, like I said, man, you are, you are a great player for sure. Yeah, it's the same. I, I feel the same way. You know, just this, this game has, has done uh, great things for me. It's allowed me to connect with good people. You know, like I said, sometimes we don't get a chance to um, – you know, acknowledge or, or, or give words to, to the guys that come before us that we actually, you know, watched. And, you know, it's, it's not stealing your game. It's just, 
you know, borrowing pieces Absolutely, of it to, to, you know, to continue to bake my cake. So you definitely, um, you know, had some ingredients with, with within my game, man. So I appreciate you for sure. That's what's up, man. That's what's up. All right, everyone. That was our interview with Walt Williams, a Maryland Terrapin legend. Um, obviously, if you're from this area, you're familiar with Walt and his story, or at least you should be. He also had a great pro career, played in a lot of a lot of good, fun teams, especially uh, in in Portland. That was one of the the cool teams to watch. And you know, you heard about his in, influence um, or how he was influenced from by Len Bias. And and Len uh, has obviously his name's come up a lot with all the Jordan talk recently. So. It's cool to get a perspective from somebody that saw both guys firsthand and, and talk through a little bit about what that meant to the community. And obviously he plays a role in this upcoming PG County documentary coming up uh, by Kevin Durant, Basketball County uh, in the Water. So uh, look for that. I believe that comes out next week on, on May the 15th, I want to say. So it's on Showtime. Please check that out. You can see Walt there. So uh, thanks again, everybody. Again, this is Believe in Wizards, B-L-E-A-V in Wizards. Check us out on social media. We're going to try to have a lot of good guests for you coming up over the next couple of weeks since we don't have live games to talk about. Um, so, so stay tuned and, and we'll see you next week.